Live from Las Vegas, it's theCUBE. Covering Discover 2016 Las Vegas. Brought to you by Hewlett Packard Enterprise. Now, here are your hosts, John Furrier and Dave Vellante. Okay, welcome back everyone. We are here live in Las Vegas for HPE, HP Enterprise, Discover 2016, this is SiliconANGLE Media's theCUBE, our flagship program. We go out to the events and extract the signal from the noise. I'm John Furrier with my co-host Dave Vellante. Our next guest is Subar Samian, who's the S Senior Vice President General Manager of HPE Security Products. Welcome back to theCUBE, great to see you. Thank you, John. Thank you, Dave. It's great to be see back. You too. So a lot of stuff's happened since we last talked, obviously in, in London for HP Discover in yeah. Europe, but security is front and center, obviously it has to be. Um, but one of the things I like about HP Discover this year is besides the theme being front and center is that you have the hacker den and it says keep out and it's dark and it looks yeah. like a hackathon and it's where the bad guys, uh, the guys who protect against the bad guys are in there. A lot of experts, we strolled in there and it was fascinating the data that they have on the breaches and the attacks. Yeah. And, yeah. and what's so fascinating about it is that how prevalent it really, really is. Yeah. Share your thoughts on the, the status of the current landscape around the breaches, the hacks, what's, what's going yeah, on? Yeah, absolutely. Well, first of all, I agree with you. The bad guy layer, the fact that it's dark, the fact that you have Red Bull and potato chips in there somehow just creates the whole environment, which is really fun. But it really brings to life um, the threat landscape. And uh, you know, we just came out not too long ago with our latest threat report. Uh, there are a myriad of these reports, whether it's Verizon, whether it's Forcepoint, and the reality is not surprising, breaches are going up, the attacks are getting more sophisticated, um, and you know, this is the new world we live in and that we need to protect. Talk about the style of hacking, because one of the things that's coming up in the data that you guys are sharing here, and also in the industry, is a hybrid kind of approach, kind of old school tactics. Yeah. I'll see, you know, insider threats to new techniques yeah, that are going great. on. Can you explain kind of how you guys came to that and what the data you have and what that means? Absolutely. Uh, we say it's an and, not an or. Sometimes we're all guilty of running to the shiny new thing. And in security, that's the advanced persistent threats. Those are new categories of sophisticated threats because the adversaries are getting more sophisticated where you really need machine learning and behavioral analytics in order to identify suspicious behavior. Um, and you need to do that because the threats are getting more sophisticated. But at the same time, you need to be aware that the top exploits of 2015 were the top exploits of 2014. And many of them were the top exploits of 2013. Um, and so you need to continue to do the basic blocking and tackling. You need to patch your applications. Um, and so it's a combination of do the basics well and make sure that you're prepared for some of these newer, more sophisticated attacks. So there's a metric out there, you guys have yours, and you mentioned there's, a, there's all different metrics, but it's, it's, it's a scary one, which is after penetration, it takes anywhere between 200 to 300, yeah. depending on whose metrics you're looking at, days to identify. I was talking, talk, talking a little bit about our, our CXO research, and the premise that we put forth that I want to test with you is that the conversation with the boards has shifted from one of we have to thwart penetration to one of we have to respond. So is that a valid premise and how is HP shifting its business and, its, and helping its customers support that? Absolutely a valid premise. We say um, you have to assume compromise and there's not a customer that I meet today that doesn't assume compromise. And if you think about that, that's a massive fundamental shift from two years ago, even one year ago. And when you assume compromise, you need to pay more attention to detection and response. You also need to pay more attention to, um, is what they're after secure? And uh, I would argue that in 99% of the cases, the adversaries after your data, either for financial gain or corporate, es corporate espionage reasons, it's your data. 85% of the time they get to your data through an application. So we see a, a huge increase in focus on let's harden the data and let's harden the application because if they're in, at least we know that the target's safe. There's some scuttlebutt out there and I've been hearing in the hallways, certainly in our research and, and when I when I'm full security practice research, but in, in talking to some CXOs and IT guys is that China, for instance, there's a huge R&D theft going on outside of certain countries, so intellectual property is a big deal. Yeah. And so you're seeing how the industry, some of these industries are built with no R&D, all kind of stolen theft. So we see that, that business model emerging. And I wanted you to, to talk about this, because this is now coming up in, in mainstream uh, boardrooms, is that there's a business model around hacks, 
and yeah. that the, from everywhere from team formations, <laughs> um, black market selling of certain roles is like, it's like a football team. You got a running back, you got a quarterback, someone's on the inside, that's their roles to sprawl and expand. Can you talk about this dynamic and then what that means to the customer? Because that takes it out from an IT so point solution execution yeah, it's, to it's, a much more holistic it's view. People, it's process, it's technology. We call this the business of hacking. And like, <clears throat> like any adversary or a corporate competitor, you make it your job to understand everything there is to know about your competitor's business and their business model in order to determine how to disrupt it. That's normal course of business. And we need to think of the hackers and the adversaries that way. They're running businesses. They're running businesses for financial gain and profit. And um, they have a complete structure. Uh, they have R&D teams. They have marketplaces and reds to market where they sell their services. They have HR forums where they recruit, train, and retain staff. And the more you understand how they build their organization and what their profit pool and business model looks like, the more you're then able to disrupt it. I mean, it's happening in the shadows, but now it's apparent. So what do you guys look at? What, do you, what, what conversations do you have with customers? Let's go down that route because that must be very difficult. And, and can you share some of the um, anecdotal conversations you have with customers? Do they scratch their head and like, what do I do? They, they face palming. I mean, what, what's happening <laughs> with the customers? Because it is a dynamic, yeah. it's a landscape. It's uh, Chris Shu has got a military background. He says the enemy's complexity in his view, but in security, you have now teams. Yeah. How do they, what's the conversations like? Well, I would tie it back to the conversation we just had, which is that um, in, if you assume compromise, and again, you look at the very sophisticated adversary, you look at the fact that they've got sophisticated and complicated business models of themselves. If you assume compromise and you say, okay, what do I need to be prepared for in the event that they get in and in the event, in the event that they actually get what they're after? Um, well, there's no reason these days, if they're after your intellectual property, whether that's structured data or unstructured data, you can render it valueless even if they get it. And you can do that with technologies that we have today around encryption, around tokenization, so that even if they capture your data, it has no value for them because it's completely encrypted. And these password vaults are becoming prevalent too for you know, man in the middle attacks and we've seen a lot yeah. of the basic, that's an old school technique. Yeah, absolutely. There's, I mean, the whole, the whole category, you know, back to the earlier conversation, the whole category of data security, I think in the context of I'm assuming compromise is becoming increasingly more important. Okay, so given that not everybody encrypts everything, response is also uh, uh, an important part of the whole remediation process. So specifically, what is HP doing to sort of shift its business toward that response mechanism? Is it more analytics, different tooling? We obviously deleveraged some security assets that yeah. maybe weren't a fit, but talk about that a little yeah, bit. Yeah, since we were together last uh, divested of the, of the tipping point portfolio in order to double down on analytics and detection and response. So we shifted that investment uh, directly into intelligence security operations, which is um, around the things we were already doing to detect known threats at scale, uh, increasing our capacity to detect the unknown with both analytics and machine learning. Uh, so for example, one of the things we've uh, announced and have shipped in the last year is the use of analytics and machine learning to detect um, malware infected hosts by analyzing DNF, DNS traffic and DNS streams. Um, we actually um, developed and tuned those algorithms over a two year period with HP Labs and our own in-house cyber defense center, the, the team that protects HPE. Um, and that is a great example of the use of analytics and machine learning to analyze a stream like DNS for behavioral anomalies that would indicate exfiltration is going on. DNS is a signal DNS that you're is looking a signal. at one yeah. data point, but you can, it's, can be telling, right? Yeah, yeah, and, and there are many data points. And so the important thing is, analytics is not one size fits all, but it is um, what are the use cases that you need to look at, and for that particular use case, what's the data science that will help you identify the anomaly, and what are the sources of data 
that you need to analyze in order to do so. So assuming compromise, assuming somebody's inside, what, how are analytics allowing you to identify, for instance, activities inside and surfacing them more quickly? Can you compress that 200 days or 300 days or whatever metric it is? Yeah, absolutely. First of all, you should understand that part of the 218, we say, yeah, days okay. is the fact that uh, part of a sophisticated attack is waiting, right? Uh, because you may rise above the threshold or above the radar, uh, but then you go back below the radar before you prosecute the next step. So uh, the Bank of Bangladesh heist is a great example, which got a lot of publicity. Right. Well, the adversaries were in, and they specifically waited until just before the start of the weekend to prosecute the attack because they knew that the um, staffing levels in the SOC would be lower at that period of time. So, you know, waiting is actually part of the game these right. days. How about visualization? How does that play into maybe compressing the time in which it takes to yeah. discover? Seeing people trying to traverse, or the, <laughs> the bad guys traversing different yeah. servers or different you're assets. You're triaging a lot of information if you're an analyst. We'll surface something that is suspicious. The question is, uh, is it malicious? And how do you compress right. the time between suspicious to malicious? And when you're looking at complex data sets and triaging data points, like, okay, that looks like suspicious behavior around an IP address, what is that IP? Is it a user, is it a host? Uh, what was happening at that time? What was happening in the previous 24 to 40 hours? And visualization techniques uh, are really valuable in terms of being able to get your arms around correlations. And we give a variety of options. Do you want to visualize it in you know, a pie chart, a bar chart, um, a spider graph? And the answer will be yes, yes, and yes, depending upon the use case. So analyzing, you know, log files to, has been sort of, you know, five years, three, three years ago was the sort of the big thing. What's next? What's you know, sort of beyond analyzing log files? What, what are we, what are we uh, seeing there? IoT. We did a big announcement <laughs> here. So seas of sensors, um, you know, getting input from the edge. We did the edge line announcement this year. We did the GE partnership here at Discover. Um, so as you look at, uh, you know, I was, I was just out at John Deere a couple of months ago, you know, a modern tractor has 330 sensors on it already. Um, well, you want to protect that environment uh, as well as use it for predictive analytics and security analytics. So, you know, the definition of what you stream in to a security operations center now goes far beyond security devices, infrastructure logs, uh, and it goes all the way out to the all the way up to the cloud and all the way out to the edge. And your portfolio is expanding presumably to accommodate those changes. Yeah. Is that it's a combination of organic R and D, you've made some investments yeah. in companies, presumably M and A. If you want to share anything with us, it'd be great. But surprisingly can, can not. You, uh, <laughs> can you talk about Who's next? So, Who are you gonna buy next? So, so uh, yeah, <laughs> how are you evolving the portfolio? So we're evolving the portfolio um, very aggressively organically. Um, and we, you know, we continue to look at M&A opportunities. I can tell you, obviously, can't share that with you this morning. And you mentioned the fact that we're uh, very actively making venture investments through our HPE Pathfinder program. Right. Uh, Hexadite uh, was one that we've done in the last six months. They're here at Discover, and they essentially, um, in the security world, they automate the runbook, which means that once you get an alert and an analyst would go prosecute a series of steps to determine if suspicious is malicious, Hexadite can automate uh, that process. That's huge because that's it's something that, that it just takes so much time. Nobody really wants to do it, but they have to do it. So and skills shortage is the number one problem. Right, and partnerships as well? I mean, is it sort of... Are there partnerships involved in, as well in solving this problem? I mean, you mentioned Hexadite. Oh. Of course, that's an investment yeah, there, but so other partnerships that you can talk yeah, about for the us, ecosystem? Um, you know, depending upon the category in security operations, partnerships with almost every flavor of security right. analytics. In uh, data security, partnerships with people like our own um, nonstop team. That's a very good, uh, you know, highly secure hardware environment is very um, synergistic with highly secure data. Uh, and then people like Teradata. Teradata is a very important industry partnership for us on, uh, on the data security side for obvious reasons. Uh, on the application security side, 
partnerships like Microsoft. You saw on stage on day one, Microsoft's global CISO, Brett Arsenal, and um, he uses our application security portfolio to protect and secure their entire repertoire of internal applications at Microsoft, but we integrate in with their development tool sets because that's a, that's a very important partnership. What about regulation? Regulation's a big deal. Do you attack regulation? Is there more regulation needed or less? We debate this all the time in theCUBE about open source. Some say open it up and then let the marketplace fill in the holes with security. So there's always been that balance. What's your thoughts on, on the regulation environment? Yeah, it, um, so ultimately I think in this space regulation is necessary. What we would like to see is compliance equaling security. And what you see in many cases is compliance adds complexity and cost, but doesn't actually translate into a secure environment. And I think the more we can make those synonymous, the better off we are. Uh, the more we can make complying with the regulation easier, which is part of our job, the better off we are. How would you describe the way in which CXOs, CIOs, CISOs should be like even best practice are communicating to boards of directors about security, about cybersecurity, what should they know? Well, they should know that there's not a one size fits all approach to that conversation because the first thing the CXO needs to agree with the board is what's our risk posture? Uh, and every company will have a different risk posture based on uh, the industry that they're in, based on the sensitivity of the data that they have within their environment, and based on what risks they're willing to take in exchange for how much they're willing to spend. And level setting that playing field is probably the first job of a CXO and a CISO. So it's great to have you on theCUBE. Thanks for sharing the great insights. Always a pleasure welcome. to get the insight that's going on in security. Uh, I guess my final question may be more of a personal one for you. Um, we were talking before we came on camera about our daughters. Uh, my daughter's pre-med and you have daughters with math degrees in science. This, what advice would you have for young people, uh, women, young girls and ladies in, in tech that they could learn from the current environment that you see out here now to navigate if they have a real passion for science or math or, or anything in the STEM field? What, what yeah, I'm sure you get this question all the time. Question. Yeah, in fact, I'll say we did, a, we did a women's forum with Meg yesterday and Meg often gets the question, what would you do differently? If, what would you advise your 17 year old self? And her comment is, I would go into STEM. Um, and to me, you know, it is the future and I would advise every young woman to go into STEM and put yourself in the growth, in the path of a high growth category and cyber is a perfect example. We just launched a fellowship with the Ground Truth uh, 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 called Tech Truth. It's a women in tech yeah. uh, fellowship. We're funding two yeah. fellows. Yeah. Um, that are going to cover the, the Grace Hopper Conference. Oh, excellent. In, uh, yeah. in Houston. That's and we have a 40 foot stage that. there with NPR, oh, good. PRI, so I'll we have a big, big presence there. Uh, um, so it's a great, great cause. Uh, yeah. Nice job on that. Thank you so much, Sue. You're welcome. Great it's insight. A security hackers are out there. It's a business model. You got to understand the competition. They're out there, and that's a great board conversation. Certainly, Dave's your work is very relevant. I think this is one of those things that's evolving rapidly, and it's critical. So thanks so much great. for sharing. Thanks so much. We are here live in Las Vegas for HPE E for Enterprise with Sue, the head of the security group here within HPE. This is the Cube. I'm John Furrier with Dave Vellante. We'll be right back. Yeah.